anyone else super happy my wife's back from women's retreat? Amy is. Oh, yeah, yeah, and Lori. <laughs> I'm more happy that my wife's back. I'm just being honest. <laughs> I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good mom. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing all the cool stuff that happened at, at ladies' retreat, though. Um, it's an exciting time. So uh, this is the part of the service where I give my spiel about the wedding conference that we're doing, this marriage conference. Uh, we got three spots left, and we're going to put it on Facebook probably tomorrow, so they'll get filled up. If, if, you have a ch- if you haven't signed up, sign up now. There's only three spots. But, but I was thinking about this verse today. I think about this verse often. I talk to the men about it often, but, but, it, but it's, it's simple. You've heard me say it. It says, a man who stands alone will fall. A man who stands alone will fall. And when I think about this verse, that doesn't sound to me like a wimpy person. It doesn't sound like it's talking about a coward or a weak person. It says a man who stands. To me, that sounds like somebody who's ready for a fight. And it says a man who stands. A brave person, I think. Alone will fall. And the sad thing I see in so many marriages is two people standing alone. And that's why marriages aren't working. It's two people standing alone, and it never works. The Bible says a man who stands alone absolutely will fall when the enemy comes against him. One of the reasons we're doing this this marriage seminar, wouldn't it stink to stand alone, Chris, when you have a a partner in your house? So this is one of the things that we're going to go over at this marriage conference is is stand together because two can stand back to back and overcome. But it also just speaks to the rest of you who aren't married about your need for other people within the body of Christ to help you through things, right? Don't try to do stuff alone. Don't try to do stuff alone. I've seen lots of people come and ask for help and then, and then like change their mind <laughs> when it's time to help, and it's not a good idea, okay? So, please, somebody throwing stuff at me? <laughs> please, 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 one more time. If you're not signed up, this is probably your absolute last chance to do it because they will be filled this week as soon as we put it out there again. I love it that we have a lot of people from the community coming. I love that. But I'd rather it be people from here who need it. So, sign up. It is your last chance. Dance. Okay. Um, so we're gonna get into we're gonna get into the service, and we're gonna talk about this this story today. That's there's a pretty familiar story, um, but it's so important. I I can't hard, hardly think of a more important subject to talk about, um, and especially with church people. Okay. So I, I was thinking about this this morning. Uh, um, years ago. Uh, I used to teach Royal Rangers um, expositions, or whatever John said. I know, I know. <laughs> John said exposition. I just wanted to make fun of him. But he's not in here. You guys can tell I made fun of him and that it was hilarious. Okay. But I used to teach high school boys. And, and back then, I used to be like super into wilderness survival stuff. And so I loved teaching them wilderness survival stuff. Uh, I worked with uh, boys at my last job, and we did some wilderness survival, like, um, courses and things like that. And so I would teach them how to start fires and uh, with, with stuff like a Ziploc bag. And I would teach them how to start a fire with a, a pop can and a bar of chocolate, stuff like that. And everybody's like scratching your head, I'll tell you later. And I would teach them how to set like these uh, deadfall traps and snares and all this stuff, you know, ways to survive. And, and so uh, people would ask me, what do you think kills people the most in survival situations? And I think that the, the answer is different than what you think it is. I always say the number one killer in a survival situation is comfort. Getting comfortable. 
People will find themselves in like a survival situation and they panic. They don't know what to do. So, you know, maybe they're in a desert and they find a little shady spot and they get in there and they feel a little bit safer. And so they stay there until they die. Or they'll find a a little cave or or something like that. And instead of thinking about uh, finding a way to purify some water or to start a fire or better their situation or maybe travel and look for help, they find the most comfortable place that they can find and they sit there until they're dead. I think it's the number one killer in a survival situation. Comfort. Today I want to read this familiar story that is so, so sad. And so important for us, especially, especially us, to hear this story and realize the importance and the gravity of this story. And this story is in the book of Mark, chapter 10, starting in verse 17. It's a story... The story is in the Bible more than once. This is Mark's version. And it's a story of a guy that we would refer to as the rich young ruler. Okay? And here's Mark's account of the story. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. I think this is important. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What an important question. Right? Is this not an important question? This is how Jesus responds. His response is super weird. He says, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. Interesting. Response coming from Jesus, who lived a sin, sinless life. He says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. You know the commandments, he says. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Starts going down the list. This guy says, teacher... All these things I have kept since I was a boy. That's impressive. Jesus goes through all the commands and and His answer to Jesus face to face is, look, I've done all of these things. All of them. Since I was just a little kid. Jesus looked at Him and loved Him. One thing you lack, He said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. That's not the thing he lacked though. Just a little extra. He says, then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. In other words, He changed his mind and decided to leave. What a tragic story. I know this is getting serious like really, really quick in the sermon, but here's the truth about people in church, people who grow up in church, people who call themselves Christians. There are people in this room right now that could possibly make this same horrible mistake. And I don't even like to call it a mistake. The same choice. There are people in this room that might make the same choice to pick worldly things over actually following Jesus. And here's the scary thing about it, guys. And this is the way that Jesus words it. This is not me trying to make people feel bad or whatever people like to say. 
This is what Jesus says. It's the same thing as choosing worldly things over eternal life. Because that's what the guy came to ask about, right? Eternal life. And Jesus said, you come and follow me. If that's what you want, come and follow me. And this guy chooses worldly things over eternal life. If it could happen to this guy, it could happen to us, it could even happen to me. This guy seemed to have so much going for him. You know, he had everything that everyone wishes that they had. We look at some of the things used to describe this guy. The first thing is, he was young. How many of you wish that you were still young? You know, uh, uh, people always tell me that I'm not that old, and I say, my body disagrees with you. When I get up in the morning, and I walk to the bathroom, it sounds like fireworks going off. It's my joints, guys. My joints. Not that. Things are cracking and popping and creaking. I don't think you're supposed to hear your neck, but I can hear my neck a lot of times. And it squeaks. I don't think that's supposed to do that. I feel old. John was talking about putting flooring in his house and how much it hurt because he's old now. He's still not in here. We can make fun of him for that too. But here's the thing about this guy. He's described as being young. That means he's in the prime of his life. You know what that means? That means he had his entire life ahead of him to follow after Jesus in person. Can you imagine? His whole life. I I believe that he had the potential to be Jesus' youngest disciple. How amazing would that have been? What kind of impact could this guy have had if he would have started following Jesus from the time he was very young. King Solomon gives some of the best advice for young people that maybe that's ever been recorded. In Ecclesiastes 12, this is his advice to young people. He says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth. Before you grow old and say, life isn't pleasant anymore. (laughs) Some good advice, right? He's saying, man, make this decision now before life happens. Get your focus on God before you start to go, why is my neck making squeaky sounds? It's not supposed to do that. Make this decision and stick to it before Life happens. Do it when you're young. Can't even tell you how many older people that I've talked to that would say, and I just wish I would have started following Jesus when I was young. And what a difference I could have made when I was young, when I still had all the energy and I I still had some fight left in me. What a difference I could have made. I hear it all the time, especially as people are reaching the end of their life. What a difference I could have made. If I would have started when I was young, I could only go back in time. I've said this a bunch of times, but nobody gets satisfaction out of what they could have done. I never sit with people towards the end of their life and, and they're just proud of what they could have done. It doesn't happen. But this guy's young. He's in the prime of his life. He's got all the energy, all that kind of stuff. But it also describes him as a ruler. This is important. He's not just a leader. He's a really important person. He's a ruler. That means he's a powerful guy. He doesn't just rule over people. He influences people. We don't know how we don't know what kind of guy this was but somehow he's a ruler over him that's powerful man imagine the impact this guy could have had if he chose as a young ruler of people to follow after Jesus can you imagine 
He's young. He's powerful. And wouldn't we all like this too? He's rich. But it's not enough to get him to heaven, is it? That's, that's the stuff that we understand, though. Okay? This is the stuff that we understand. Yeah, I, I get it. You don't go to heaven for being young. That's stupid, right? You don't go to heaven for being a ruler. You don't go to heaven for being rich. We get that. But then we get to the stuff that we feel like should get us there. This is where the story rubs a lot of us the wrong way. He's not just rich and powerful. He's also a really, really good person. I don't know how many times I've heard people, even Christian people, I don't want to argue with them because it's usually not a good situation to say, yeah, but I know, I know they were a good person. This guy is a moral, good person. Like I said, this guy looks Jesus straight in the face and tells Jesus straight to the face, I have kept all of the commandments from the time that I was a little boy. And Jesus doesn't go, you liar. Right? He says, I, I, I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't defraud. I honor my parents. All of this stuff. And he says these things straight to Jesus' face. And Jesus doesn't call him out on it like, you liar. You know why? I think he's telling the truth. I think he's telling the truth to Jesus. Jesus, I, I, I don't even break the commands. I follow all of the commands. And he says it straight to Jesus. Jesus doesn't call him a liar. He's a really good person. And he's better morally, I'm just going to go out on a limb, probably than any of us in here. You get how serious this is. Morally, he's probably better than every one of us in here. This guy is rich, and he's powerful, but he didn't get there this, the way that a lot of people did at that time. He's not like a tax collector. He's not lying. He's not cheating. He's not stealing to get where he is. He somehow did it morally. Without lying, without stealing, without hurting people. He's a really good person. And if that's not enough, it seems like he's also a really good religious man. It's the only explanation that I can come up with why he would follow these commandments so closely. I say this all the time, but if you, if you don't believe in Jesus, why not lie? Right? Especially if it's not hurting anybody else. Blah, blah, blah. Right? Why not? If you, if you don't believe in some kind of moral compass, which we would call the Bible, why wouldn't you steal to get ahead? Why not? Why not lie if it's not going to hurt somebody else? All of this kind of stuff. I think this guy is a religious man, and he wants to please God. And this is why he comes and he kneels before Jesus, asking him, what else can I do? What else can I do? He's a good religious man. But he learns pretty quick that what we consider good and what God considers good isn't always the same thing. This guy's everything that most of us want to be. He's wealthy, he's respected, he's young. He has good moral character. But something is missing. And that's what brings him to Jesus, right? Here's the scary part. Maybe we're more like this rich young ruler than we think we are. Maybe you're not super wealthy, but you have a lot more than a lot of people and none of you can even argue with that. You have a lot more than a lot of people. But maybe you're a really good person. There's a lot of good people in this building, man. 
A lot of good people. Maybe you never lie. Maybe you never cheat. You never steal. Maybe you treat everybody the way that you want to be treated. Maybe your neighbors love you. Nobody has anything negative to say about you like this guy. So from the outside, by all accounts, you would be considered a really good person. The problem is that being a good person according to man's standards is not enough. Jesus said it himself. No matter how bad we want it to be. In fact, Jesus said, nobody is good. This man calls Jesus good and he says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. This is a little bit confusing and I've heard people get really confused by this. I've heard people say that Jesus was saying that not even himself was good. But that's not what he's doing, okay? I think he's given this guy a chance to say, I call you good because I believe you're God. Jesus is hinting that he's God. Why do you call me good when only God is good? Giving him a chance to say, well, I think that you might be God. But Jesus says that no man is good, nobody even this guy standing in front of him, who maybe is the best guy around, I would think. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what if we take it even a step further? I'm not just a good person, but I never miss church on Sunday. I serve in the nursery. I always tithe, I give extra, I read my Bible regularly, I worship, I raise my hand. Sometimes I even come up to the front when Dusty offers to let people come to the front. I even do that just like this guy did. So you you come up to the altar and you get on your knees. That's great. That's what this guy did. And Jesus said, you ain't making it. You're not going to make it. Kneeling before Jesus just doesn't mean that much if you're not willing to give up what He's asking you to give up. That's called religion, guys. Jesus is about relationship. That's the important thing about calling ourselves Christians. It's not religion. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. And here's what religion does. Religion will make you comfortable right where you're at. That's not good, is it, Larry? Religion will convince you that you're safe. It'll convince you that you're doing everything right. Even if it's left out a true relationship with Jesus completely. Religion will still convince you you're doing everything right. You're safe. And so we get comfortable there, and that's where we stay. It's not good. That's why he says, get rid of it all. Get rid of it, and come with me, and follow me, and eternal life will be yours. It's so important. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says, For for by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's hard for us to think about this story sometimes because, I mean, some of you are doing it right now. I, I get it. Because you're thinking like, how could Jesus turn away such a good person who is trying so hard and who has been trying so hard since he was a little kid. How could Jesus turn him away? Guy was looking for the same answer that a lot of us are. You know, he wanted Jesus to say, man, you've already done so much. You're good. 
But again, we're not talking about being a good person. We're talking about making it to heaven. Do you see how important it is? The truth is that Jesus doesn't turn this guy away at all. And this guy kneels down before Jesus. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then he doesn't turn him away. He does the best thing that he can. He told him the right way to find eternal life. The only way. It's the guy's decision to leave and not come back. Jesus never turns anyone away. But that's hard for us to understand. It was hard for his disciples to understand too. Look at what it says in verse 23. It says, Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. We are really confused by that too. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. He doesn't even mention being rich that time. We miss that. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Disciples are super confused by this. They're like, oh crap. He can't make it. Who can The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? If this guy can't, then it's hopeless for the rest of us. That's what they're thinking. Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. Look at how confused the disciples are. They're confused. Why? Because they're still stuck on the whole works thing. The guy's done so much. He's, he's a good person. He follows all the commandments. He does this. He does this. So they're probably thinking, well, a rich person, person they, can, they can easily buy God's favor by giving to the church. Or taking care of needy people and stuff like that. And they're like, man, if rich people can't be saved, then who can? Here's the thing about this, guys. This is where we get confused. And I mean, there's people that get it sort of close, but they're still off a little bit, I think. Jesus isn't saying that wealthy people can't go to heaven, okay? You get that? He's saying that there is no hope. I want to make this very blunt. There is no hope for people who think they already have it all. This is what he's saying. People who are controlled by what they have or the idea of how good they are. Let's not get caught up in that, man. They say, who can be saved? And basically, Jesus says, nobody can. Nobody. With man, this is impossible. No matter how rich, no matter how good, no matter how religious you are, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible, including eternal life. And then Jesus tells him exactly how to get it. By making Jesus the most important thing in your life and following closely after him. We talked about this when we were talking about the valley, right? If I'm a sheep and Jesus is the shepherd, I want to be as close to him as possible because he's the one that's going to protect me from the things that want to kill me. Right? So I just want to be as close as I can. This is the kind of relationship that Jesus wants us to have with him. Just follow me. Do what I do. Go where I go. And 
not talking about being a good person, guys. It's far more serious. We're all talking about eternal life. We're talking about making it to heaven. That's a big deal. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way, the only truth, the only life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No matter how good, no matter how religious, nobody comes to the Father except through me. Did John leave? He did? That pumped. I think he told me. I would have loved to have done that song again if he was here. Listen, guys, there's no guarantee that you're going to get another chance to respond to Jesus' invitation to follow him. When you get up and you walk out of this room, there's no guarantee that you're ever going to get another chance to follow Him. I would take the chance now. You can be saved. You can have eternal life. You can live a life full of maybe not comfort. (laughs) That's not the guarantee. Maybe not comfort, but you can live a life full of confidence in your salvation. I would rather have that. Would you rather have that? I would rather have confidence in my salvation than than to do all of this stuff that kind of gives me this false sense of security and, and comfort. I want confidence in my salvation. And it only comes by surrendering everything to Jesus. Repent of your sins and trust Him as your Savior and then follow Him. It means learn what He was like and do that. Follow Him. Try to be like Him. Learn everything you can about Him so that you can imitate Him. And so that hopefully other people will see Jesus in you and want to be like you. Right? Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Look, I know people don't know what Jesus is like, so I have to give them the best example that I possibly can. It's the best I can do until they get to know him. Does that make sense? Romans 10, 9 through 10, it says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you are that you profess your faith and are saved. You know this guy turned his back on Jesus and made a decision not to follow Jesus and Jesus went to the cross for him. Still. I did a a message one time that said Judas betrayed Jesus with clean feet. Jesus washed Judas' feet and then Judas went out and betrayed him and Jesus went to the cross for Judas and people like Judas no guarantee that you're going to get another chance to accept this invitation that Jesus is making to follow him the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus the only way the only way not about coming to church but keep coming 
It's not about giving. It's not about all the things that you do for the church. That stuff's great. But it's not a ticket to heaven, guys. You might have grown up in the church. You might have been here every Sunday since the day you were born. But if you never had a moment where you accepted Jesus as your Savior and you made a decision yourself to follow after Him, I'm, tell, I'm telling you what Jesus would say to you. Follow me. Doing, you're doing good, but you need to follow me. So if you've never had a moment where you accepted Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to be as blunt as I can. You're not saved yet. You just go to church and you're a good guy and maybe a religious person. That's awesome. Maybe everybody looks up to you. That's great, but you're not saved yet. As serious as I can put it. So we're going to give you an opportunity today. If you want to close your eyes and bow your heads. Do it the old-fashioned weird way, but it's the best way I know how to see. I'm going to ask you, don't look around. Just let people have a private moment. And I'm going to ask you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've never decided to turn from your own ways and to follow after Jesus, that's called repenting. If you've never done that, if you've never repented of your sins, made a decision to follow after Jesus and ask Jesus to be your Savior, and you want to do that now, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand really quick and put it right back down. Awesome. And then unfortunately, sometimes we, we make a decision to follow Jesus, maybe in our youth, and then life happens. Life stinks sometimes, man. Sometimes, really not on purpose, but it is our decision. We've kind of strayed away from Him. And so maybe you're sitting in here today and you're going, look, I, I've served Jesus, but I know at this moment I'm not really following Him. But I'm going to start again. I'm asking you the same thing. You're deciding I'm going to follow after Jesus again. I'm going to ask you to put your hand up real quick and put it right back down. Awesome. All of heaven is rejoicing. If that was you and anybody else who's in here, you can just repeat this prayer also. You would just repeat after me, dear God, thank you for loving me. I know that I've sinned against you. Please forgive me for that sin. As I turn my back on it, and I turn to you, I believe that you sent your son to pay my debt. I believe that he died for me, and you raised him from the dead. I ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Make me a new creation. I give you control. Guide me and help me to know you better. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. Megan's going to sing. I'm just kidding. Megan's going to play for just a minute. And I just want to, I, I, I just feel like we didn't finish church if we don't have this time. Even if nobody comes up, it's okay. But as she plays for just a couple of minutes, I want to open up the altar just for you to maybe 
maybe just come and talk to God and just make that step. And especially if you, if you made a decision, it doesn't have to be this, but if you made a decision, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Maybe this is just like the first step. Something that can represent to you and, and, and to God that you are taking steps to follow him. And maybe you want to come up to the altar and you want to do just like that song says. And maybe just tell him, I just want you and nothing else. I just want you. I just want you. Nothing else. And just make that commitment to him. Tell him, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Ask him to guide you. Ask him to lead you. Ask the Holy Spirit to touch your spirit when you're making bad decisions. Make a decision to listen when he does. That's what I want to do right now. I'm going to be quiet for real for just a couple minutes. And then I'm going to get up here and pray one more time and then we'll be dismissed. But the altar is open. Man, I highly recommend time at the altar. Now is your chance. ask the prayer partners to come up. And they're up here to pray with you if you have a prayer request about anything at all. I just want to give you an opportunity to come up and be prayed for. And I'm going to pray and and you guys will be dismissed, but I just want to encourage you, like I do every week, if you have prayer, don't leave without being prayer, prayed for. If something in your life needs to be fixed or better, or you need guidance, <laughs> don't leave without asking for prayer. And they're not going to share your business if you're not being hurt or someone else is being hurt. They're not going to share your business, okay? So take that opportunity to have somebody pray with you but let's all stand together like a family now let's close in prayer Dear God we thank you for this day God we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to follow after Jesus and God we are sorry that sometimes we just go through the motions of the things that make us feel comfortable in our salvation but God we understand that the only way is through your son and so God we thank you that, that you've given us that opportunity again to follow after Jesus God we thank you that people are accepting the invitation to follow after him and God once again we pray that as people do that, maybe people who have been in church their entire life, 
but as they are making a decision to truly follow after Jesus, that something would change within them. God, that we would look different, that people would see peace and joy in us that they don't have, and that they're going to listen to our explanation that it comes from following after Jesus. God, we pray that you would give us the perfect words to say at the perfect time to share the love of Jesus with people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, we love you guys. Thank you for coming.